Hello, everyone. Welcome to Prologue, our digital holiday version. Um, we have a couple coming up. Um, today, we're talking to Shanta, Shanta Thaik, and next week, Jessica Hansen. And we're so excited to be able to share these in such an unusual time, but speaking with such wonderful people. Um, as always, I want to start out by thanking you for joining us and also thanking our sponsors. That's the Department of Visual and Performing Arts, um, Theater Works, uh, the, the Chancellor's Office at UCCS, uh, and the Dean's Office also at UCCS. All of those supporters and of course you tuning in make this possible. Without further ado, I wanna jump into um, our talk today. And I've invited someone who I've worked with a little bit over the years in New York City. And this is Shanta Thaik. And Shanta, thank you so much uh, for joining us and for talking a little bit about your career in the arts. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, um, well, I was just, we were just talking a little bit about, about the prologue series. And one of the things that, that we're so grateful for is listening to people like you who have extraordinary careers and, and unique careers. And I wonder if other than, I'm gonna just the, the basics, which are you were one of the, the brains behind the, the modern incarnation of Joe's Pub and this ca wonderful cabaret club in New York City. And you're also now the associate artistic director of the public theater very recently. So congratulations on that position as well. Could you just talk as a way of introducing yourself rather than here's you know the biography of everything I've ever done since I was born. Um, but I wonder if you could just introduce yourselves to our viewers by telling us a bit about what drew you to the theater. Why did you get into the theater in the first place? Yeah, I think um, probably like most people, I found my way into theater by uh, via community theater in my hometowns, um, doing plays. Uh, for the town, doing our uh, local school productions and just feeling uh, like there was so much of the joy that I found as a child. And most of my uh, connection to what was my community at the time was through either church plays, uh, school plays or uh, plays in the community. So I think I found it very early on. And then my, my mom had been a dancer when she was a child. Um, my grandmother was a singer professionally uh, in India and then in Malaysia, and my aunt was a dancer and grew up with us in Wisconsin and went to school at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point um, for dance and then dance management and moved to New York to work at Alvin Ailey, um, not as a dancer, but on the administrative side. And so I think all of those, you know, it just was a clear outlet. Uh, for so many people in my life and it surrounded me and felt like uh, performing was a part of really everyone's life. <laughs> and I just <laughs> sort of continued uh, to bring it into mine. Um, could you say a little bit about what, what took you to, to New York City and specifically uh, to the public theater? Yeah, I, the public, um, well, I will say, so my aunt who works at Alvin Ailey, still works at Alvin Ailey. Um, we are both lifers in our chosen uh, institutions, <laughs> but um, we would come visit her all the time in New York, and uh, and I fell in love with the city. I grew up in Indiana, um, in Wisconsin, and then Indiana, so all very small towns in uh, Midwest, in the Midwest, and uh, the allure of New York City was one that I just could not shake, and I was determined to get there one way or another, um, and so I went to school for acting. Um, and got my degree in theater in with a you know focus in acting, um, but also got my degree in management, which I thought was totally useless. Why? Where would I use that? <laughs> but ended up being quite useful, um, and moved to New York to be an actress. So I came to start auditioning, and um, but I had my headshots with me and was trying to figure out my life, and I brought them to Ailey. Uh, where my aunt uh, introduced me to James King, um, who uh, was the managing director there at the time and had previously been at the public. And she was like, oh, he's in theater. He'll look at your headshots. So he looked at my headshots. Um, and I think very quickly probably sensed that I was not <laughs> set for a life in acting and uh, mentioned to me that George Wolf was looking for an assistant and, uh, and would I be interested. 
And I went the next day and interviewed um, with George and Irene Cabrera, who was George's assistant at the time, uh, to be George's second assistant. And they hired me that day. And I started the next day, like 10 days after I moved to New York. Um, and I started working at the public then. And, and just for context, for those who may not know, George Wolf was the artistic director of the public theater, still an extraordinary director, uh, a legend really in American theater life. And, and I think that's a good segue, you know, under, under George's um, artistic directorship, the Joe's Pub came to be, if I have my timeline right. Could you talk a little bit about what Joe's Pub is, um, how you got involved in it, and, uh, and maybe we'll go from there. Yeah, um, Joe's Pub is a cabaret venue, about 180 seats, uh, located within the public theater, uh, founded by George Wolf, um, and it was meant, to, I think it originally it was meant to be sort of a pre-theater, everybody can get some drinks and then maybe it'll be a place where we develop musicals or think about some cabaret shows of artists that we love. It was a place where artists would curate in its sort of um, beginning iteration um, alongside some incredible staff. And uh, then it really had its own, a life of its own at nightlife. So the, the people that ran the bar side of things, so the restaurant, the food service, um, who were concessionaire agreement, uh, were this incredible nightlife, you know, dynamic company who had run um, night, you know, cabarets and nightclubs all over the city. And so it became this hotspot, but really for the programming that the public wasn't really actively doing, for the, the programming that was happening after hours, these sort of 11 p.m. and, be, and beyond uh, programming. And when Bill Bregan, who's my predecessor, started at Joe's, he started right after or right before he started in August of 2001. Um, so right before 9-11. And um, once that happened, the, the real mandate for the space was you need to figure out how to make this place, um, this space work, um, both financially and artistically in a way um, that will allow us to keep it keep it going and that we wouldn't just turn it over and become a restaurant fully. And, um, and he did that. He really, um, we went from one show a night to really trying to do two shows a night. Eventually we took over the late night programming and, um, and, you know, now do anywhere between 700 and 800 shows a year. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's quite, it's quite a space. It's a beautiful um, sort of bastion of freedom uh, in New York City where really anything can happen at any given point. And I think people come to be surprised, um, but also to have an, an amazingly intimate experience with some of their favorite performers. You're just in a space where the dynamic between performer and audience is so blurred. It really feels like you're a part of the performance in a way that I think I was really drawn to. So I started working at Joe's um, almost immediately. I loved working with that team. It was, they were like the cool kids um, working at the public. And I mean, everybody was the cool kid at the public to me, but it just was fun. You go downstairs and get a drink. I started volunteering to uh, stage manage the shows at night. And I just fell in love with the whole, with the whole thing. And I was seeing so many incredible shows, so many incredible music shows that were just blowing my mind. And so many theater shows around town that were not, you know, I mean, aside from the work that George was doing, which was insanely incredible, Top Dog Underdog, Elaine Sturge at Liberty was on the West End, Radiant Baby we were de developing, um, which is the Keith Haring musical. And I mean, there were so much amazing things happening at the public, but I think by and large, I was really very moved by the pace and, um, and the energy that was happening at Joe's Pub. So I, I sort of, once I realized I wasn't gonna be a performer, um, which I luckily realized quite quickly, I, um, I moved over to Joe's. <laughs> um, I wanna dive in a little bit more to some of the work that happens at Joe's. And I, and I know I, I've seen a lot there, but before I'd been there, describing it is almost impossible because it's an energy <laughs> and it's a feel. Um, but but I, I wonder if you could talk talk a little bit about the sort of range of types of performances that go on in there. And I know cabaret generally is kind of anything goes. You sort of, this, this bastion of freedom, I think you said, but it, you know, a typical night at Joe's, what might I see? Yeah, I think actually the word cabaret has plenty of um, 
you know, images attached to it that actually are not the images I would attach to being in Joe's Pub. Although I would say that everything that happens in Joe's Pub is a cabaret. It is in a cabaret space. It is, it completely informs what people do in the space in terms of um, artists that, you know, have never spoken to their audience before all of a sudden find themselves telling their life story before introducing a song. Um, just the way that it's set up is it's really like a curved space. It was designed around the idea of an accordion. So it really feels like you're inside of an accordion um, and sort of being hugged by the room. And, um, and I think that sort of that that embrace really extends to the artist. So the artist on stage, and you know, I've heard this from thousands of artists over time that they feel incredibly comfortable on that stage in a way that, and connected to their audience in a way that they perhaps haven't. So I think the architecture does a lot and it's beautiful sound, beautiful lights. Um, and then it's really, you know, just a, the stage is the size of your dorm room. You know, it's 14 by 11. Um, it's teeny tiny. We should have shoved like up to 20 piece bands on it. Um, and the idea behind it is to really reflect the diversity of both New York City um, in terms of demographics, ethnodemographics, but also in terms of genre of music. So I think, we really do try to look at the calendar and say, okay, we have a lot of singer songwriters this week. What else do we have in the mix? What kind of world music do we have? What is the, what is our straight ahead cabaret? What is downtown performance art? Um, what is just a rock and roll show? What is, you know, and we're really looking at that mix to, to maintain that integrity of reflecting the city. Um, and I think the, the intention behind that is to really make sure that it feels like a place where everybody can find a home. And I think we have, we have really done that over time. It's not, and we've done that by virtue of a lot of feedback um, from artists and communities <laughs> and actually listening to that. Um, but I think it starts with really centering the artist and understanding that they are the center, generally speaking of their community. And so if we can make them comfortable, we can make that community comfortable. Um, and it's been, it's just a beautiful space to, to experience that. I, I have to say, Shanta, and, and, and maybe some people listening will, will remember a couple of years ago, um, my greatest experience at Joe's Pub, I was there with my uh, colleague and friend Aisha Ahmed Post, and we saw Martha Graham Cracker. Um, uh, and, and with a couple of cocktails, uh, it was an extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinary evening of, of, of performance and fun. And I think it was after that, and I, you know, we we spoke with you and, and and brought Martha, otherwise known as Dito, um, to UCCS, and we did a small cabaret here. So, oh. um, as closest to the feeling of, of Joe's Pub as, as we oh, could so create. Beautiful. And, I love and that. Nice. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, um, that's that's part of it is really feeling like the artists are carrying. You know, when we when other people have tried to recreate Joe's, which people try to do all the time. Um, the the easiest way to do that is by um, bringing in some of the artists because they really carry that energy with them and you can put as many like tables and chairs up as you want but until you have that energy of an artist that can really command a space like that and feel comfortable in it it's it's a totally different experience I know you produce 800 people a year and this is a crazy impossible question but who are some of the, like the sort of the staples of Joe's pub and and, and maybe even some names we we might know um, outside of New York? Um, I would say, I mean, the big, you know, the big ones that have come through, um, Adele uh, did her US debut, Amy Winehouse did her US debut at Joe's. Um, we've had some incredible, incredible luminaries from, you know, the Patti LaPones of the world to, um, Darlene loves holiday shows to everyone in between Eartha Kit used to do New Year's Eve. Um, I would say the staples we, we, I mean, I can't think about Joe's pub without thinking of the cabaret legend icon, Justin Vivian Bond, um, incredible folk singer, Toshi Regan, um, voice of every revolution that I care to join. Um, uh, so many, I mean, to our artist list is so varied. I think Losers Lounge comes up a lot. They're doing their show next week. We just filmed them in Joe's pub. So um, hopefully that'll be, they're gonna do a celebration of one hit wonders, um, but they're essentially like New York's house band. 
Um, so many, oh God, now I'm of course blanking on the- Oh, the I mean, that, it's, those are that's, nice. that's, a, that's a good starter list. Sandra Barnhart does, you know, New Year's yeah. every year. We've got, we've got runs with everyone. Perfect. Um, Shanta, I want to introduce you um, and some of our audience who might not know her to AJ Bacchiades, who um, has been joining me on these prologue talks, especially this year. Um, and AJ is the uh, one of the ethics ambassadors here at UCCS and often has an ethics twist and questions and is fabulous. So AJ, I'm going to turn the proceedings over to you. <laughs> Maybe. Thank you so much. Hi. Um, so Shanta, along with being um, like the director of Joe's Pub um, and all of the public theater uh, artistic programs, uh, you are also one of the co-directors of Global Fest. So I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about that and what kind of goals you hope to accomplish with that. Yeah, absolutely. So Global Fest uh, was also started in 2003. Um, so the same year that I started working at Joe's Pub, I started working at Global Fest and, um, and it started and it was started as, um, as a movement, as an idea in relationship to 9-11. Um, and the tightening of borders around 9-11 and the visa restrictions that were starting. And it is challenging in the best of times to bring bands from around the world to the United States. And at that time, and in our current time, um, we didn't fix it in our 17 years of producing Global Fest, unfortunately. Um, it has, you know, it's it's very difficult. It's very expensive. It's very hard. You have to, you know, the, the rules and regulations around bringing music. And at the same time, we felt like if there's anything we need right now, it is this music, this culture from around the world to bring into our country to show people the humanity of these cultures that they have no access to otherwise. And to, um, and to really bring home what actually makes us, what keeps us um, are grounded in what is similar about our cultures, what is incredible always about seeing a human from another side of the world that you thought you had nothing in common with that all of a sudden you're dancing at the front of the stage to. So um, we started Global Fest, or Bill Bragan, Isabel Sofer, and Maury Aronson started Global Fest in 2000. And, three um, to really bring that home, to showcase bands from around the country that then presenters um, from around the country would be at Arts Presenters Conference that happens in January and then bring those artists to uh, their cities around the, around the country. And um, Under the Radar started the year after that. Um, and then a, a slew of other festivals began to pop up in January um, following Global Fest lead of taking what were the artistic experiences that were happening in January, which were generally happening in the hotel rooms and conference rooms around this Arts Presenters Conference, putting in them into a more uh, real life context and putting them in rooms where there were actual ticket buyers and people that were, you know, buying into the ideas and actually experiencing the work um, as uh, fans and not just seeing, you know, a lot of arts professionals sort of standing in the back with their arms crossed, you know, examining the work, <laughs> but really have, being around people that were actually enjoying the work. Um, and we found that to be incredibly successful in bringing artists uh, back for tours in the country. That's incredible. Um, kind of a follow up question. Uh, what are some of like the impacts you've noticed on the communities where you bring in these artists? Well, I think, you know, I think we all have examples of moments that this has happened for us where all of a sudden you're listening to a song and recognizing, oh, wait, this isn't in English. This isn't, um, this isn't something that's familiar to me. And yet I feel it in a way that speaks to me or I'm introduced to an artist who all of a sudden I care about what's happening in the Ukraine because my favorite band now is Daka Braka, who is this incredible art collective band from the Ukraine who's actively talking about the issues in their country um, in the way that, you know, at Joe's and in every music venue, you walk into a room where an artist is at the center and all of a sudden you look around and everybody sort of has a similar vibe. You know, the artist is what is the center of that, that story, that narrative that's being created. Um, and a community is built out of that. And I think the ability for artists from around the world to tell their story 
um, to people that would otherwise never hear it. I mean, you see that with Pussy Riot too, so many incredible bands that are bringing, that are using their music and music is just a really clear um, way to cut to people's emotional centers um, and in a way that I, I really resonate with. Um, and so I think that that's, that's I, I, we've seen it at every single place, you know, and every community has these incredible music festivals. Um, and there's usually going to be like one or two expressions that are coming from elsewhere. And of course, there's a lot of also um, purely world music festivals that happen around the country. Um, but I think you'll also go to any um, major commercial festival. You know, we used to program a stage at Bonnaroo every year uh, for Global Fest also, but it would, it would just be incredible because people would be going from uh, Chance the Rapper to Fish to Daka Braca. And um, that sort of mix of, uh, of narratives really um, was really beautiful. And I think that the curiosity that that sparks is, is one that I, we were deeply invested in. You know, if, if I could um, follow up on AJ's question and, and, and that answer, um, Shana, um, we have a new, new, I guess it's still new, a couple year old building here in Colorado Springs, um, the Gantt Center for the Arts, which of course in these times is mostly empty right now as is our arts venues across the country. Um, but I wonder if you can talk about not, not only the venue, but arts organizations and their importance to a community. I think we often think about, okay, what's this, what's the theater season? What are the seven or eight shows I'm going to go to see this year? But I trust that you think of a theater as more connected to a community than just the two hours traffic of the stage. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, the hope, the hope I think in the dream and the ideal is for a theater to be a community center. Um, a place where you can find joy and restoration, where you can meet people you wouldn't meet, where you can create with people you wouldn't normally create with, where you can create if you wouldn't normally create. That there is a, um, an imbued sense of creativity that has a center somewhere in your community um, that you can participate in either. And I mean that all, you know not just as a performer, but as an audience member, because I do think, especially in this time when I think about what we're missing right now, I really miss being an audience member. You know, I miss that performance. I'm a great audience member. <laughs> I'm like the best audience member. I emote all the time. I cry every five minutes. <laughs> and that was important to me. And it was important to the artists that I love. You know, I had people tell me all the time, oh, I saw you out there. I heard you laugh. I, you know, and that meant more to me than I think I realized until this moment. And I think. Um, so it is my hope that theaters will really center themselves in that experience, really appreciate their audiences for the first time or in a new way, um, and open up a little bit wider to audiences that were perhaps not welcome previously, um, that are, you know, in the beginning of COVID, there was all that talk of the donut model, I think, of like the Netherlands and all this idea of like, how do we take care of one another? How do you actually look across to, you know, that you're not actually, your job is not to sell tickets to the same 300 people over and over again. Your, your job is to take care of your community. And what does your community really need? Um, and I think, um, I don't know. I, I, I really, I do, I know that I'm asking those questions in a new way, in a more urgent way. Um, trying to pay attention, asking different kinds of questions um, and showing up in a way that feels necessary because the, the, if you weren't necessary before COVID to your community, um, you're not gonna be necessary after COVID. And that will, that will I think show up in a very different way. Um, so figuring out what is that proposition? What is the way that you need to listen perhaps differently? Um, and, and maybe change entirely to meet, um, meet those, those needs. Um, but I do hope it's a sort of joy-centered, civic-focused um, theater that is in our very near future. Kind of um, following up on that and knowing that both Kevin and I are part of a department that kind of focuses on this idea of interdisciplinary art uh, I'm really interested in the fact that the pub and Global Fest are known for music. 
So what are some ways that you would suggest being more um, action oriented towards this kind of um, integration of multiple artistic disciplines? Yeah, I think it, it sort of depends on where you sit in the organization, but um, I would say in general, I'm always surprised by the lack of curiosity or not, not by everyone, but certainly um, this idea that the arts are so segregated in their strange little bubbles that we've decided, no, this is theater, this is music, this is um, the fine arts. And I think museums do a really good job of breaking that down um, and figuring out like, how are things speaking to one another? Or how, are, how are these mediums meeting? Um, certainly the performing arts field and the presenting world is more interested in, in how, how the same audience perhaps is experiencing dance, jazz, classical, um, theater, um, perhaps theater least of all in those scenarios, unless it's, you know, big Broadway touring shows coming through. Um, so I, I think, you know, I, one, I think we need to pay attention a little bit more to our artists and what our artists are asking. I think often artists are very interested in, in something that maybe doesn't exist yet or is a mix of where their influences are coming from. You're not gonna meet theater people that don't listen to music or that aren't interested in working with a composer or in a new way. Um, I think often as administrators or you know wherever we first meet an artist in their journey, we try to put them into a box or say, you know what would be great if you just like, Write a, write a well-made play and then we'll talk about it instead of living in the messiness of not exactly knowing where the thing was going to land because we don't know if we have the space for that. We don't know if we know how to produce that well. Um, and I think if we could follow the artist um, a little bit more closely to what the organic process is, we'd probably land at a better um, piece of art at the end. That's also more expensive. That takes a little bit more resource. The US is not very good at resourcing our artists for projects like that. Um, so, you know, it's gonna, re it requires also probably a little bit more collaboration from various departments, various arts organizations, um, a little bit less siloing of ourselves into what we think we need to sort of stick with. But that's, um, that is what I love about working at the public is that I feel like there's, there is plenty of room for that. Um, I think there's probably more room to find, but it's certainly, I haven't gotten bored yet um, figuring out how to make an artist's work possible within the various sort of warren of places that they could, they could move their work in the public. So, you know, we're talking about some specifics, but also sort of, you know, philosophy and, you know, what, what is the point and what is the ethic of a, of the ethics of a, of, a, of a theater company, of an art center of artists generally. But I wonder if you could zero in on some of the specific examples, maybe some stuff that you've done at the public. I'm thinking about mobile and, and public works and some yeah. of those other things. And I should just say, uh, I was telling Shanta earlier, um, many of you theater work supporters and students know that um, theater works under Caitlin's leadership is, has done a mobile version of taking Shakespeare out to, to various communities and, and it's worked so beautifully. Could you give us a few spe specific examples of this intersection, this greater um, copacetic, if I could put it that way, intersection of arts and, um, and communities uh, around the city of New York? Yeah, I mean, I'm learning all the time. I would say it wasn't my, where I came into the field or certainly um, how I understood art making. I'm learning it from my colleagues that run the mobile unit and the Shakespeare Initiative and Public Works. Um, it's something I understood through my work at my church, but it wasn't something that had like followed me into my direct art creation sphere in the same way or not way that I would have like defined for myself. Um, but what I'm learning is that, you know, the mobile unit takes Shakespeare um, to community centers, to incarceration facilities, to um, shelters and parks around the city. Um, and, and really through uh, our new director, Karen Ann Daniels, is really about deepening even those relationships and saying, okay, now we come to your facility a couple times a year, but what do you people really want to see? What is what is the conversation? Let's We've gotten all this survey feedback. What is really like, what's driving this community? And certainly we're going to have to go back into that conversation now. We're in it, um, but really deepening. Okay, now we're in post-COVID New York or during COVID New York. Um, 
it's a totally different landscape. We don't want to just show up doing the same exact thing that we did last time or what we were planning on doing. We can't do that. That's absurd. <laughs> they don't, it's, it doesn't make any sense. So it's about this mutuality, about really understanding what you need and what we can provide. Um, Public Works is another beautiful program run by Lori Woolery um, that is about going into communities, partnering with incredible organizations who already have these deep structures and are serving their community in beautiful ways and asking, what do you need in this community? What is there anything that um, hasn't been funded that you would really ask for or um, that your community is asking for that you don't quite have the skills to provide? And so, and we'll do that for free. We'll show up with our class and our incredible teaching artists and we'll find the right fit for what you need. Um, so that has manifested as dance classes, it has manifested as poetry readings, it has, you know, a book club. And those things have all evolved over time as the community needs have changed over time. And as those community members have said, you know what, we don't want to do a book club anymore. We want to actually perform. We want to do scenes. We want to, we don't want to do Shakespeare anymore. We want to do August Wilson. Um, so those conversations are shifting all the time and are, um, I think that's why that team shows up every day because it's not doing the same thing every day. It's actually responding. And, um, and then that public works culminates in this 200 person pageant in the Delacorte theater in, you know, in the best of times. And we'll see what it will be, um, in the, in the coming, you know, years, but, um, is always this beautiful celebration of what it means to be a New Yorker and in community with people from across um, different boroughs, which so rarely happens, you know, in any of our cities, we sort of stay in our own little bubble and here it's a real invitation to collaborate across, um, across geography. Oh, you're muted. Uh, how many times a day do I start speaking about it? Uh, <laughs> um, you've, um, we've talked a little bit about in New York, but some of these initiatives that you talked about have spread and are in different cities around the country. So there's proof that it's actually working beyond just a big theater center like New York. But I'll ask the, the, the uncomfortable question, which of course is, you know, we, we're theater companies, art centers are in this model of selling tickets and subscriptions and that sort of a revenue driven model. Thinking about what you said about public works and going into community and maybe offering arts classes or just finding out what how you can be of best help doesn't for, for producers doesn't they're, they're having trouble finding like where's the money for that and how do we actually do that and how do you answer that question yeah I think it's you know I mean none of what we do makes money right there it's not we're not in the business of um you know, creating this product that is flying off the shelves at its exact value um, because of the point is to serve people to actually meet our community and, and, and make a case um, for being worthy of funding support and philanthropy. Um, and that's, a, and that's tricky. I don't, I, that's not something that is um, easy or, or even you could be doing the most beautiful um, transformative work and still not get the funding you deserve that that those things don't match one to one. Um, unfortunately, I wish they did. That's not how our system is set up. Um, I hope it will be sometime, you know, who knows, maybe I just need to move to the Netherlands. <laughs> like my little idealism uh, would suggest. But in the meantime, you know, I think we do have to be constantly interrogating for ourselves, why are we doing this work? Why does it matter to whom? And how do we um, tell that story in a way that will get a funding community to support it? Um, and will get, um, and is organic enough and feels actually rooted enough in the work that the community is speaking for it um, themselves, you know, that it isn't just a singular uh, charismatic leader fundraising but it is actually that the 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 community cannot imagine itself without this particular program this particular building this particular institution the set of relationships are so deeply ingrained in the community that the community will support it um, again i don't i know that those things are hard and when we start when public works affiliates um, start all over the country 
that's the biggest question, you know, that's, that's the work is, okay, how are we redefining our values? How are we talking about how we are bringing this work? How are we collecting the right data to support the argument that we are making change um, and that this work is necessary? Um, but I think, you know, that's, that's, thankfully, we have a lot of really beautiful writers and creators and data collectors to do that at the public. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, but I think we're, it's tough. It's a tough, it's a tough landscape for sure. Um, mm. But I think the real work is about being necessary and hopefully the funding uh, follows. Yeah, I think, and I also think I'm thinking about this a lot and talking with you and some of your colleagues about the, the place of the university. And of course we're sitting here yeah. at the university where we're students, idealistic minded students wanting to make a change in their communities and going out and, and, and embedding that in part of the educational process and then making sure other people follow along and seeing, I think you said in some ways, looking at it like a church or a yeah. community center where you're not really thinking about the funding structures quite as much, but actually thinking about the good you can do for your community. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, I mean, just to say that as an arts professional and as a non arts professional, like to actually at a university setting, talk about the value of the arts and what it means to not to be operating in a nonprofit model, what it means for people that love the arts to serve on boards, for that to be part of your practice as a citizen in your city to support the arts, even if you don't want to work in the arts or you decide that the arts are not for you professionally. Um, but that should be part of your practice. That is part of being a citizen of your town is supporting the things that make your town work. Um, and supporting the arts, I think, should be a critical part of that. Nobody wants to live in a town that there are no arts, that there is like nothing to do at night. You know, I've been to those towns. They're terrible. <laughs> awful <laughs> and you don't want to you don't want to do that you know and um but it does mean that you as an individual whether you go into the arts or not are responsible for that and um and i i hope that we can move into a world where it really feels like people do hold that that they are responsible um and for, you know, in a church, it would be tithing, you know, but what, where's your 10% of your income going to support the community that you love, um, that the community that you want to continue to live in and, and grow in. And that doesn't have to be fully to the arts, but it should include the arts. Mm -hmm. AJ, go ahead. I asked a bunch of follow-up questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. Um, but something that does keep coming up is, is the idea of community. Um, and a lot of the artistic programs at the public, um, like Mobile Unit, uh, involve going out and experiencing these artistic acts in the community. Um, so how do you go about fostering a mutual relationship of trust and respect when you go out to these uh, groups? Well, I'll say that we get it wrong um, also. It's not, it's not also, there's not like a one way. It really is about relationship and relationships take all sorts of forms. They take a lot of time. They take a lot of trust. There's plenty of communities that have lost trust in almost every organization that has ever partnered with them. And um, so I think at the public, we talk a lot about longitudinal relationships, which means if we commit to a relationship with you, we really want to be in it for the long term. We're not going to like come in and do a show with you and then never see you again or have all these great conversations and let's brainstorm forever and meet everyone in your neighborhood and then, um, you know, never see you again or just offer you tickets to Shakespeare in the Park and, and assume that that's enough to keep the through line of our conversation going. Um, and that's, that's hard. That takes a lot of work. That takes people. Um, and, um, and you really, and it also takes people invested in staying at your organization for a while. Um, that it's not like every time they pick up the phone to talk to the public, they're talking to a new person at the other side of that phone line. We're really hoping that what we're building um, is a value on all sides. And um, so I think, you know, it's as simple as relationships and it's as complicated as every relationship you've ever been in <laughs> where there's, there's a lot to it. It requires care. It requires an actual ability to listen um, and not make assumptions. 
um, about what the other party wants or needs or, um, or the fact that they want or need anything actually that, that, um, that we're coming in as this like beatific, um, force to, to bestow our beautiful art on everyone, but that actually we may have something to learn, um, from every relationship that we're starting. Um, so yeah, I would say the, the real commitment to whatever it is really like investigating um, with the intention of making sure it's a long-term relationship um, is, is a good starting place for us. Um, AJ and I were talking about um, some of the things that we wanted to, to ask you and you've already touched a little bit on, on 2020, the year that is, gonna, is already going down in history, especially in the arts community about how do we address this and we have a couple questions and I, I sort of wanted to start with you oversee a lot of special artistic projects to the public. Um, can you talk a little bit about ways that you've adjusted? I mean, Going online, obviously, is what we've all sort of figured out we have to do in a certain degree. But what are some of the things that you've learned that have worked um, uh, this year? Um, I would say I really I, I mean, I would just like double back to the relationship piece. I think really um, the things that have proven the most valuable in this time uh, have been our relationships, um, being in connection to our city in a way that I think even, you know, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had those, the ability to pick up a phone and say like, what's happening in parks across the city? What do they need? What's happening with um, staffing? Where, what are food pantries doing? Being able to connect communities to one another around need um, has felt in a moment where it felt, plenty of moments where we felt like we couldn't be useful all of a sudden those relationships were what made us useful um, to the city and those connections to people and places across um, all boroughs was, was incredibly helpful. Um, I would say the other, you know, I mean, we do have an incredible artist community um, and artists that were ready, willing, able, incredible at adapting to the technology, wanted to adapt to the technology, had always wanted to adapt to the technology. And that's a place we really didn't feel like we could meet them um, appropriately or didn't follow their lead. Um, and now we're able to um, in sort of surprising ways, whether that was just taking over our Instagram for you know every Thursday or um, creating a Zoom play or um, putting documentary theater you know, to use in a moment where it was hard to know what was happening um, across the country and specifically, you know, with Jessica and Eric, um, Jessica Blank and Eric Jensen and their play the line about frontline healthcare workers in New York City at a time where it felt like, and like New York was living its completely own life in what was COVID and understanding the sort of gravity of the, um, of what that disease is and, and its effects on, on humans and our healthcare system, um, in a way that felt like we were just totally alone. Um, and I think that that story was able to play out in real time because of Jessica and Eric's incredible ability to do documentary theater. Um, and yeah, I think beyond that, I feel like we also found an audience that was not um, available to us because we had not reached out. We had not been accessible either because they, people didn't live in New York. We reached incredible international audience almost immediately. Um, but also the hard of hearing and deaf community, um, reaching them through closed captioning, um, reaching a Spanish speaking language through captioning, finding like this incredible new audience of people who had felt either excluded um, purposely from our programming or geographically from our programming um, are now part of our, our extended audience and family, I think, hopefully from now on. So I think the, the challenge from this point is to make sure that's a longitudinal relationship and one that just doesn't live in this 2020 time, but is really thought of as an opportunity. And I hope we, I hope we do that. I, I love the, the reiterating the idea of the longitudinal relationship. That's so, so critically important. And 
And, and, and then I also was sort of referencing back, you know, your mentioning of your church and the idea, I mean, I, I know we've said this, but the idea of seeing cultural institutions in a community like churches, like community centers, like theaters, like art centers, yeah. creating those longitudinal relationships that those things should be seen very much in the same, in the same vein. Oh, absolutely. Um, P.S. Before I forget, um, the line which Shanta mentioned is fantastic. I don't know if it's available to still see. I don't know if you know it. Probably not. Someday. Oh, I know. I hope it. I hope we can bring it back, but I don't think. Yeah, I mean, it was. It was a moment in time. It was. It was no, we managed to make it like a theatrical experience, and that you had to be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll read it when it comes out. AJ, I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn it over to AJ again. Um. So. You've mentioned a few times, um, especially, especially with like Global Fest and such, um, this idea of reaching different demographics. Um, and I know with the Black Lives Matter protests and the racial reckoning in American culture, um, it's been discussed more and more recently, especially in the artist communities. Um, but I was just wondering, like, how do you think that arts organizations can hold themselves more accountable and be more forward thinking and transparent in developing strategies for addressing inequities and injustices. Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably as many ways as, as you can imagine. Um, I feel like, you know, theater specifically, although this extends to plenty of other art forms and institutions, um, strangely found value in being exclusionary or figuring out um, some, or there was some, you know, secret agreement amongst <laughs> us over time. Um, and I, I don't say that to be too flippant, but it does feel um, strange to look at our field and see the all of the barriers that we have put up to enjoying the work that we create. Um, and not just not barriers to who gets to create it, barriers as to who gets to enjoy it, barriers as to who gets to be comfortable enjoying it, um, who can afford it, um, all of those things that we have, it feels like have been quite um, systematic about. And one could say that that system is white supremacy and, um, and I think make a very good case for it. I think there's, as many ways to dismantle that as there are ways to create it. Um, I think the We See You White American Theater letter that has been widely circulated has a lot of great ways of doing that. And I hope theaters around the country are reading it and, and really taking that seriously. Um, that this is not a, uh, you know, a privilege. This should not be a privilege. Theater is meant to be experienced by, if we really believe that this matters, we need to believe that it matters for everyone um, and that there's something for everybody to contribute to this field. Um, and I don't know, I just, I feel like that it is um, in a way that certainly there are plenty of, of ways that this shows up in music and, but music does feel much more porous to me in terms of um, the ways that the art moves through and finds its community and, um, and, and who gets to participate and, and how that works. There's still plenty of inequities. And let me tell you about like the men's room line at South by Southwest versus the women's room. <laughs> it's like the, the easiest place to go to the bathroom if you're a lady. Uh, but <laughs> there are, you know, there is just a different, there are so many structures in place in theater that, um, and, uh, and plenty to undo, I think, to get to the heart of, of why we really see ourselves as a, as a place, uh, a necessary place in our society. Um, so I'm, I'm really hopeful for this time, you know, a time where we have to rethink everything anyway, um, and make a case for ourselves and our cities and, and really show up in a way that, um, that, that matters. Um, and I think we're going to do that by listening, by reading, by, um, again, bringing our artists back into the conversation in a way that perhaps they have felt totally outside of it. Um, and, and centering, um, centering a new kind of voice, um, and multiple voices. I also think, you know, I, I, at Joe's too, you know, 800 shows, that was not all my taste. There are plenty of things that we booked at Joe's pub that I didn't even really know that much about. 
Um, and that's because we booked those shows because of either somebody else on my team that felt passionately about it, somebody, another artist who loved this artist that was telling us about it. And that to me is so, um, so much more powerful in terms of trying to reflect a city um, as diverse as New York, but as diverse as every city, because there's, there is no monolithic, you know, place that we're talking about here. We're talking about communities that are, um, again, as diverse as the people that live in them. And, and that is, um, that can mean a Polish community next to a Hungarian community, next to a Lithuanian community. Um, and how are you having a nuanced conversation? Well, you can't, if you're showing up as somebody from Indiana with an Indian mom and a German dad, I'm not, I'm not about to tell you about your Hungarian culture in a way that, that, <laughs> speaks to you directly. I need to listen to, I need to find a Hungarian person to tell me what, what is the word on the street? What do people want to listen to? Who's the artist you're listening to? What is the, you know, and I think unless you're uh, curious about that, you're going to get it probably um, wrong. A super broad question as we as we close out our hour, um, Shanta, we, you've already given us so many reasons to feel optimistic about the future, but in this holiday season, you know, as you know, as suffering from the weight of what was a very difficult year, and it's going to continue to be difficult for a while. What are the things that you're most looking forward to? What's your optimism about the arts as we as we move through this time? Well, you know, I'm optimistic about transformation. Um, I, I really do think, you know, perhaps we had it a little too good for too long or too easy or had like greased a very specific pathway um, that was working uh, for a very specific uh, group of people. And, um, and then if other people found their way in or, or had the right handshake, they, they, they got to be part of the, the party. And um, and so I think that this is like a moment to be forged in the fire and, you know, my best days, I, I think that that's, we're having hard conversations. I love having hard conversations um, about race, about money, um, about life and death. You know, these are, these are moments that are preparing us um, for some, some great moments ahead, I think, I hope. I hope that we are able to have harder conversations with the people that we disagree with, be able to listen a little differently to the people we disagree with, be able to see theater that represents these conversations in a new way and doesn't feel so easy. Um, or maybe we're not going to th see theater because it's easy, but because it's challenging or because it's addressing these issues. So um, I have really, I have a very, I'm very optimistic about the art that will be created in the time that comes um, the time that's happening right now and the time that will come after this. Um, I have no doubt that uh, the artists are reckoning with this in a way that um, that is going to be incredibly transformative to our society um, and we'll come out of this stronger, uh, maybe not happier for a little bit, although, um, strong. but stronger and that's that's not a bad thing. Um, and so I'm 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 grateful for the, for not for this time necessarily, um, and certainly not for the incredible pain that our artist community is going through right now, I think more so than almost any other community in the country. Um, but I am, I am, I am hopeful that we will, we will move through this together and also understand the value of an interconnected society in a way that maybe we didn't. Well, Shanta, I am grateful for you and your time and all the wonderful things you've shared with us and our community. And um, I, I have had a hope to bring you out here for a while to speak with us in person and maybe hopefully looking into the future, maybe I can convince you when things calm Thank down. You. I'm going to go anywhere. I'll go anywhere. You're gonna, okay. <laughs> Come to Colorado <laughs> Springs. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, be before I say my final thank you, I, I want to acknowledge AJ and, and her terrific questions, Jared Verner, who's been the, the man behind the scenes making this happen on our YouTube page. And I want to tell the viewers, um, I hope you'll join us next week um, at, at seven o'clock on, on 
Monday, the 14th, I think that is, uh, we're going to be hosting the voice of NPR, Jessica Hansen. She's going to talk a little bit about vocal qualities on the stage and the radio uh, and lots of other things. Um, and, and AJ and I are busily planning several prologues based around um, dance and dance practitioners in February, along with Tiffany, my colleague, and some other folks. But Shanta, it has been an honor to have you join us for the last hour and spread your good wisdom. And I look so much forward to having you visit us in person soon. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.